Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to try to get my hell mic here working. Okay. Is this on? Can you guys hear me okay? Is the lapel on? <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is... Uh, this is so exciting. I, I mean, this is probably one of my favorite things uh, I look forward to uh, throughout the year. And now 2015, we, we have four of them going on. So this is going to be a big year. And I just want to say I appreciate um, all of you uh, in your help supporting this event, coming out to these events, and um, not so much standing up for Jeremiah Cry Ministries, but standing up for the gospel's sake and the means and by which God has commanded us to go into the world and proclaim it. Uh, where doctrine's important, theology's important, uh, how we see Jesus Christ uh, is important. And, and uh, majority of the pulpits today, uh, it's, it doesn't seem like it's that important. That's why we exist as a ministry. And that's to stand up and confront the spirit of the age. And uh, that's with the gospel of Christ uh, in the means by which God has thrust us out into the world. And I just want to thank all of you. I especially want to give thanks to uh, First Baptist Church for allowing us to come here and have this event. We're, we're, just, we're, we're so thankful um, for being allowed to come here and use your facility and to have your support behind us to be able to do an event like this. I want to thank Brother Dan Weekly for his uh, just exhausting labors and putting all this together and really helping out and making all this possible. And I want to thank all the speakers uh, who've taken time out of their busy schedules. I know all you guys are extremely busy uh, for taking time to come here and not just writing us off as some crazy little apocalyptic little end times ministry out there shouting on the streets, but that this ministry is, is taken seriously. And we take the gospel seriously. We take God's people seriously. We take the local church seriously. And we're just, we're just really excited about what God is doing. And we thank God for all the, the, the ways by which he allows us to come in and be able to really come together like this. If you would turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 18, please. I'm going to be reading from verse 1 to verse 7. I'm reading from the uh, King James Version. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and he joined affinity with Ahab. And after certain years... He went down to Ahab to Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go up with them to Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together prophets, four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, I just... 
come to you now, Lord. Much fear and much trembling. And I thank you, Lord, for your grace. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, I just thank you for what you're, you're doing here today. And I pray, Father, that your Son would be exalted and glorified. And that the churches in our country would no longer be careless about the Word of God and about the Gospel. And that Jesus Christ would be worshipped in our land once again. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you would use a misfit like myself for your glory. I thank you, Father, for the, for the words that will go forth in this room today. And I pray, Father, that there would be open hearts, Lord, that the Spirit of God would touch, Lord, and transform people for, for your glory, Lord. That we would gad, gather together as, as one man, fearless, Lord, in the power of your might, Go into the world with the gospel of Christ. Why we still have time, Lord, to proclaim your name. Father, I just give this time to you. I give this entire event to you. I give all the speakers over to you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father, that you just remove any vanity, Lord, any of the celebrity syndromes that may float around. I pray that you just kill it, Lord. I pray that, the, that Lord God, that we just be removed from the fear of man. And I pray, Lord, that you would be feared and you'd be lifted up and you'd be exalted and you'd be praised today in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There is yet one man. God always, always provides the man. It has been said the hour brings the man, the crisis furnishes the hero. This hour, ladies and gentlemen, calls forth the man. But we ask, where is he? If the crisis furnishes the hero, then what does he look like in our day? Because all the clamoring voices out there today seems like from every direction, everything that calls itself Christian has an ideology or a definition of what it is that we're supposed to be doing as the body of Christ. Today there's an overflowing deluge of lies and scams and perversions and deadly false doctrines being propagated and peddled behind many American pulpits. It is all but overthrown and brought calamity and destruction upon us in our day. Ezra said, the land into which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another, with their filthiness. There is great need, as the Puritan Christopher Ness writes, that some servants of Christ should run to stop the spreading of this plague and leprosy. Thus Moses stood in the gap and prevented the destruction of Israel. He stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed. The Lord in his complaint declares, I have found none to stand in the gap. O Israel, thy prophets are like foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge of the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. With lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad and strengthen the hands of the wicked by promising him life. Speaking of plagues, in 1665, according to Tom and Thomas Vincent's long and powerful sermon called God's Terrible Voice in the City. If you've not read the book, I encourage you to do so. Wherein are set forth the sound of the voice in a narration of the two dreadful judgments of plague, 
and fire. Inflicted upon the city of London, he, like many others at the time, believed the fire was a punishment from God for London's sins. He lists 25 sins in detail, such as religious hypocr hypocrisy, lying, swearing, laziness, drunkenness, pride, gluttony, envy, lust. But you know what the worst one was? It was the slighting of the gospel and its messengers. In Vincent's introduction to the true Christian's love to the unseen Christ contains a description of the outbreak. He says, on every hand were to be heard the groans of the dying, the lamentations and the distress of the survivors. In vain did thousands look for consolation in their last moments from those who had ministered to them the word of life. Dismay and terror had alike seized the pastor and his flock and a place of safety from the plague was all that either the one or the other had time or in general the inclination to seek. He describes what he saw in that day. He says, now the cloud is very black and the storm comes down upon us very sharp. Now death rides triumphantly on his pale horse through our streets and breaks into almost every house where any inhabitants are to be found. Now people fall as thick as leaves from the trees in autumn when they are shaken by a mighty wind. Now there is a dismal solitude in London's streets. Ministers now had their awakening calls to seriousness and fervor in their ministerial work to preach on the side and brink of the pit of hell into which thousands were tumbling. One portion of the book read that there was actually ministers who during this time of the plague as people were just getting wiped out left and right, they literally dug their graves behind them because the plague was coming in, in its intensity was getting stronger and stronger and stronger and those who would catch it were starting to die quicker and, and the momentum started to build up and the people who caught it didn't live long, sometimes only a few hours. That's how strong the plague grabbed people. And many of the preachers would go out and proclaim the gospel. Those who stayed in the city would proclaim the gospel with their graves dug right behind them. Talk about commitment. They preached the gospel to those who were dying and perishing all around them without the thoughts of their own lives. Could you imagine that? Digging your own grave behind you as you're proclaiming the word of God, knowing that there's probably a good chance that you're going to catch this thing. And when you're done with your sermon, within a few, maybe hours later, you're going to be lying there dead. You see, the gospel means something. It meant something back then. Vincent was pastoring a flock that was at the heart of the outbreak. And he was strongly urged by fellow ministers to flee the city. In one of the more remarkable cases of pastoral sacrifice, he refused. He said he would not allow any to weaken his hands in this work. He could not bring himself to leave his flock in the time of their greatest need and committed himself to the protection of God. Without fear, it goes on to say, he rushed into the scenes of contagion and entered the dwellings of disease and death. And though upwards of 68,000 died in London, including seven persons in the house in which Mr. Vincent resided, yet did he continue in perfect health during the whole season of this visitation. It is worth noting that Vincent had no divine revelation that promised his safety through this plague. There is no guarantee that he would be immune to the disease as long as he was engaged in the Lord's work. He understood that committing himself to the protection of God did not obligate the Lord to preserve him. 
So he asked the question. So why then would he risk his life to enter into the jaws of death itself? What was the prime motivation and by which a man would put himself in the face of danger and proclaim a gospel, proclaim the word of God in the face of many that even at this time didn't want to hear it. He says this, if you have but little love to Christ, you will be apt to faint in the day of adversity. To shrink when you are called to take up his cross and suffer for his sake. Lesser sufferings will decompose you. Great sufferings will frighten you and amaze you. And you will be in danger of turning into fearful apostates in time of great trials. There is need of great love to Christ as well as great faith to carry you through sufferings with courage that you may persevere unto the end. You see, there's a greater plague today. Much worse than 100,000 being wiped out in London, followed by a great fire the following year that just brought devastation. There is great devastation in our land today. I'm not a gloom and doom prophet. I'm not giving you any end time predictions. I'm just saying it's pretty obvious. And to sit back and just kick it under the carpet and preach pretty little sermons to everybody and make everybody feel good about themselves is obnoxious. We cannot be ashamed of the gospel. It doesn't matter what the majority says. It doesn't matter what the consensus says. It doesn't matter what the unanimous vote is. Which one of us today be yet one man? There's one man. Which one of us today will be willing to stand up? We know ultimately it was Christ who stood in the gap and bore the full weight of God's wrath upon himself. We know that. But Jesus also said in the book of Acts that we've been endued with the power of God to go into this world and proclaim the gospel in the face of an apostate world. This is what we're called and commanded to do. But what is the gospel, we asked ourselves? What is this? I mean, evangelism today is the title of this conference. Not just because it's catchy. Because there's, there's confusion. I was talking to Daniel yesterday. I said, you know, I see, oh, there's like, what, 100 churches before we got to this church, all over the place. And I said, sure, I mean, there's always, obviously, there's always those who just neglect the gospel altogether. But I do believe that there are those churches out there that just have lost sight of what evangelism really is. I believe that. I believe you go to one of these pastors or their church and said, are you guys out reaching the lost? They look at you like, How? What does it look like in a day when it's been so muddled? What is it? What is preaching the gospel? Is it filling teeth? Is it donating to a water well in Uganda? Is it building mud huts in Mexico? I mean, it, no shame to them. It's just that it's, it, it's been so just muddled. People have lost sight of what it truly means to proclaim the biblical gospel. And then when you bring it up to somebody, when they ask you what you do, they look at you like you have three heads. What do you do to reach the lost? Um, I go out and I preach the gospel. You almost feel like you got to apologize. They look at you like, what? I mean, you don't go to take them to a wine tasting bar or... Take them to a pizza party first and do all these things. No, we proclaim the gospel. We engage the gospel. We engage the culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We engage people verbally with the public proclamation of the word of God. This is what we do. Nothing fancy. But the Bible says, how shall they hear without a preacher? And what they hear is equally important. Not just hearing. You can tell them all kinds of crazy things. But the reality is we must proclaim the biblical gospel to the world, unashamed. 
To set the stage for Micaiah, we are first introduced, or should say, startled in the beginning of chapter 18 to see Jehoshaphat yielding to the flattering power of Ahab. You see, it's really a tale of two kings and one lonely, unpopular prophet. Jehoshaphat, whose history and track record reveal a life that was pleasing to the Lord, where the Lord bestowed upon him his great favor, riches, and honor. But great prosperity had the usual fatal effect upon Jehoshaphat's character. It is here we see the devastating effects of the godly aligning itself with the world. Joining affinity with the wicked. Being lured partially by the deceitfulness of riches and power. Thrown off course by flattery in this artificial social cesspool. This kind of behavior leaves us ripe for judgment. And reduces us to absurdity such as preparing to go into battle with worldly means opposed to heaven-sent direction and God-ordained wisdom. But yet, there is one man. Vince Lombardi, the famous coach from Notre Dame, stated, fatigue makes cowards out of us all. But I'd go on to say that mixing and mingling with the worldly Ahabs of the world and its pleasures and its trinkets makes cowards out of us all. You start tampering with all the man-centered gimmicks and start doing all these things, takes the life right out of you. That's why when someone says, well, we just take the gospel out to the street, you look at them the way that you look at them, like, what? It's so foreign today, and it shouldn't be. Preaching the gospel to lost people shouldn't be foreign. It shouldn't. It should be normal. You shouldn't have to explain yourself. You shouldn't have to feel like you should have to apologize. You should be forthright and brave and give glory to God that he would use men like us for his glory. We must never confer with the wicked and the world as how to overthrow the enemy. Ahab was Israel's most wicked king who was married to the most wicked woman. We must always, whether popular or trendy, Trust in the name of the Lord. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of our God. Here we see Ahab's flattering placebo preachers, his personal yes men, rooting them on with their fashionable prophecies of encouragement and furthering his destruction. Jehoshaphat, recovering from his temporary insanity, awakes with an urgent request to find a true prophet of the Lord, besides the 400 false prophets. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah the son of Imlah. But I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. And then he says, go and fetch. Go fetch Micaiah. But my question is, why the hatred? What's the, what, why so much retaliation and agitation to the truth? The scriptures tell us very clearly. I believe it's, in a lot of ways, Ahab represents the spirit of the world. The scriptures ask us this question, why do the heathen rage? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Jesus himself declared before the lying false prophets of his day as well. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth. Reverend Robert Hawker writes, Who in the days of Ahab would have ventured to have called into question those 400 prophets? who with all one voice concurred in sending Ahab to battle with full assurance of his success. 
and who backed their commission in the name of the Lord, and who would have ventured, who would have ventured to come forward when the poor solitary prophet Micaiah from the prison foretold the awful event hanging, ready to fall upon the head of the king and have justified his faithfulness. Zedekiah apparently was the leader of these 400 prophets. At this moment, made himself horns of iron. And began clanking them together and prophesying. It's, 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 it's amazing when um, a true prophet is getting ready to come on the scene. How all the false ones and the fake ones get all excited and stirred up. They have to make a show. They have to compensate for their void. They have to do something to bring attention to themselves. To affirm themselves with people to try to affirm themselves with God. They, they seek the approval of man. They want the glory of man. They have to compensate. They make a bunch of noise and act foolish. We see it out on the streets all the time, even in Camden. It, it's not, the, it's not the, um, the, the druggies and the gangbangers that, and the homeless people that you've got to worry about in Camden. It, it, it's all of the false cults that are out there. You've got the black Israelites, you got the Muslims. They're the ones that are getting angry, but they're the ones with the beards all the way down to their toes. They think somehow the way they look and the way they dress and the way that they appear, they appear so holy before men that somehow they have to compensate for their, their, their spiritually void. And somewhere they have to pick it up. And that can even happen today in Christian circles. You feel like you have to become somehow affirmed by others. You need the consensus to make you feel good about yourself. You need the approval of man. You need to be affirmed. And this is why you see a lot of the crazy behavior that goes on Facebook and different things. If it was really about the Lord Jesus Christ, you'd become of no reputation. But see, we, we trick ourselves into believing that Luther would have done this. This is, you know, God would have, would have me to stand up and, and fight this thing. You know, we forget that rebuke should come privately to a brother if he's caught wrong or talking to someone privately about an error. But somehow we justify our behavior and all it boils down to is you're compensating. You're compensating because of insecurity and you're looking for approval and popularity. And it just basically sets something completely different. It shows what you're trying to do. It's prideful. And this is everything that Micaiah wasn't. But I believe when the gospel's preached and the truth is declared, men get angry and they retaliate and they get agitated because they know that God exists. In verse 12, it says, And the messenger, who is an officer sent, that went to call Micaiah, spake to him, saying, Behold the words of the prophet. Declare good to the king with one assent. Which means with one mouth in the original languages. Let the word, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs. And speak thou good. Heaven forbid that we would say anything against the status quo. This is exactly what this messenger, after he apparently pulled Micaiah out wherever he was, whatever prison, it could have been something like Jeremiah, it could have been a hole, we don't know. But we do know that the whole walk back, he was harassed by this messenger. Ultimately, that was ordained of God, Telling him to be of one ascent, to be of one mouth. Just be like everybody else, Micaiah. Just speak good to the king, like everybody else. And that's the message that's been given to us today. Just speak good things. Just be nice. I wonder sometimes what we would have said to Micaiah on the way back to the gates. What would we have whispered into his ears? Would we have said to Micaiah on the way to the gate, would we have whispered in his ears and tried to get him 
to bow to the consensus of the age? Or would we be like John Knox, who has said, spare no arrows? In Micaiah's response in verse 13, it says, Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. And this is powerful. In verse 14 says, When he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he said, Go ye up and prosper, and they shall be delivered unto you. Many people think here that um, Micaiah cowered, and he flinched. But if you read it here, he didn't, he didn't speak in the name of the Lord. I personally think it was a rebuke to Jehoshaphat's compromise. Could be wrong. But I don't see any lack of bravery in Micaiah whatsoever. And the, a lot of the commentators and theologians agree with that position. That the first response was dealing with Jehoshaphat's compromise. And then he turns it around and he begins to prophesy. You see, the first point that I want to make when we're looking at Micaiah is the fact that he was unpopular. Five minutes? He was unpopular. He was unpopular. I mean, rifle through the pages of Scripture. You don't see him hardly anywhere. Not even talked about or referred to in the New Testament. He's not even a minor prophet. I'm not even sure exactly where he fits into all of that. But he only comes on the scene sporadically. And he delivers a devastating punch. As a matter of fact, a couple of them. Where did they fetch Micaiah from? A palace? A mansion? I think of Christ's definition of John the Baptist. It came to my mind. He's like, what did you expect to see? A reed swayed by the wind? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. He came out of a hole or a dungeon. It doesn't necessarily say. He certainly wasn't at the gates having a party with everybody else. You see, we must be humble people and quiet and denying ourselves in this day. Jesus says, Woe unto you, and all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. George Whitfield said, Let the name of Whitfield perish, but Christ glorified. In 2 Corinthians 5.15 it says, That Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Jesus had become of no reputation. Paul declared that he was crucified unto the world and the world unto himself. Jesus said that the religious leaders of his day wanted the glory of men. He says, you love the glory of men and to be seen by men and to be heard by men. They loved to, be, to appear holy before men, but they were haters of God and jealous of Christ and couldn't wait to kill him. Jesus says, ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. If you belong to the world, Jesus said, it would love its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The second point Micaiah was outnumbered. It wasn't just unpopular. He was also outnumbered. And this is, this is awesome. And we see this through the entire scriptures of how God takes just a minimal few. He saves by many or by few. It's interesting at the very beginning of the word of God, the very beginning, Noah's time, when he confronted the entire world. Noah was right and the whole world was wrong. It's interesting how Christ refers back to that time when dealing with even our days today. Micaiah was outnumbered. 
But the scriptures tell us in Exodus 4, 12, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou should say. Jesus makes a similar declaration. For I will give you a mouth in wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to withstand, refute, nor resist. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He was outgunned. I mean, you had all these 400 prophets. You had the, the pomp of Israel there at the very gates. The gates have so many different meanings throughout the scriptures. We knew that it many times it was the place of judgment. It was a place where the poor hung out. It was a place where, where, where people were. And a lot of things took place right at the gates. I can almost imagine the thoughts running through Micaiah's mind as he was coming towards those gates. I mean, what a dichotomy. What a change in the atmosphere. You ever come out of like a, a place of darkness for a long period of time and then come into a totally different scene or come out of a very quiet place for a long time and then get thrust into a real loud, obnoxious environment? I mean, the change there must have been radical as he approached those gates, as he saw those kings sitting there at the threshing floor and all the prophets there. Imagine what was going through his mind. I mean, I don't know for sure. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I could think what would be going on in my mind. Insecurity, inferiority. What am I going to... Look at me, I'm a slop. Pulled out of a mud hole. Good chances. Been in prison. Been alone. Been in solitary confinement. But he's been meeting with the Lord. Men like that pray. Men like that fast. As a matter of fact, when the plague hit London... That when the pastors started to fast and pray, the plague disintegrated within days. And I bet as Micaiah was approaching those gates, that all kinds of things crossed in his mind. But one thing that he knew, that he was going to stand for his Lord. He knew that God was with him. Outwitted. There could have been a possibility that he felt outwitted. I mean, you think of, here's such a, such a, a, a change. I mean, you see the, almost like two standards here. You see one in all of its pomp and all of its glory. And then you see this little lonely prophet just kind of coming towards here. This is two great differences here. And here he comes. And I mean, I know from even my own personal experience, a lot of times I just get so thrust into being an intellectual at times, and I, I forget that the power of God rests in Christ. That the Spirit of God arrests men, not me. And all their intellectualism. Jesus said to the Pharisees in his day, you search the scriptures. Because in them you think you have eternal life. But they testify of me, which you won't come to me that you may live. You search, and you search, and you search. But you won't come to me that you may live. And we see this fanaticism going on here as he approaches. And the Bible makes it clear that God uses the weak things of this world to confound the strong. He uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. When you have the combination of riches and abundance and flattery hanging out with the wrong people and making infinity with the wicked, filled with a bunch of false prophets, this type of atmosphere calls for a man of God to trumpet and to proclaim the truth. If I could leave you with this last story. I know my time is up. If you guys could just let me finish here. I want to tell you a story about a man who existed in the 12th century. Uh, I was reading J.A. Wiley's The History of Protestantism, which I find absolutely fascinating. If you can get a hold of that, get a hold of that. It's absolutely amazing. And one day I came upon a story of an Italian preacher of the 12th century named Arnold, called Arnold of Brescia. It says during this time that it pleased God to raise up yet one man, a champion to do battle for the truth, a man who was unknown then and still remains much unknown today. He lived during a time when it seemed his entire world was covered in darkness. Everywhere he looked, much like today, he saw the clergy from their head downwards engrossed in worldliness. 
The church was drowned in riches. And from this immense wealth, the corruption flowed. The reckless extravagance, the ignorance, the wickedness, the intrigues, the wars and bloodshed, which have overwhelmed the church and state, he said, are ruining the world. According to Wiley's history, Arnold, early in life, had received into his heart the light of the gospel. Why in France? He then, sometime later, returned home, still attired in his monk's cloak, his countenance stamped with courage. Arnold then took his stand in the streets of native Brescia and began to thunder forth the word of God. His townsmen gathered in great crowds around him, stirred by his mighty preaching of the word. The people were melted and roused beneath his fiery appeals. The suddenness and boldness of the assault seemed to have stunned the ecclesiastical authorities. And it was not till the bishop of Brescia found his entire flock deserting the cathedral and assembling daily in the marketplace, crowding around this eloquent preacher and listening with applause to his fierce and fiery preaching that he bestirred himself to silence this courageous monk. Arnold was then condemned, hear me now, to perpetual silence by an alarmed clergy. This was in 1139. Arnold then fled to the wilderness and in the valley of the Alps found shelter among kindred spirits. He was soon found proclaiming the truth in the canton of Zurich, Switzerland, where Zwingli afterward appeared. Conspiracies were, conspiracies were formed against him. The whole power of Rome was directed to his overthrow and ruin. Arnold said to himself, might it not be possible to bring back those glorious times? Might it not be possible, ladies and gentlemen, to bring back those glorious times? The ancient gospel of grace? One author writes, we cannot contemplate the lion courage of Luther at Worms without emotions of enthusiastic admiration. The admiration is just. And yet the bravery of Arnold, fully equal to it, if not superior, is seldom mentioned. A lone man in a still darker age, here he was all alone, unsupported by the presence and sympathy of princes as Luther was. Arnold breasted and defied the whole thunderstorm of Rome. Driven from his shelter, he passed the Alps and planted himself in the midst of his foes, he entered Rome itself. And with the sublime, sublime example of his master before him. Wiley remarks, one feels surprised, bordering on astonishment, to see a man with the condemnation of a pope and council resting on his head, deliberately marching in at the gates of Rome and throwing down the gauge of battle to the Vatican. Gibbon calls it the desperate measure. Arnold kept his course, however, and continued to launch his bolts. He flashed the light of truth in burning eloquence over the seven hills until Rome bent her knee. Freedom triumphed for the hour. Rome woke from the slumber and the slavery of ages. The powers of the clergy were again concentrated and directed against this preacher. The heresy of Arnold was considered twofold. He dared, said Gibbon, to quote the language of Christ. My kingdom is not of this world. That the church was a distinct and spiritual assembly of baptized believers. And as a consequence, the heinous crime was laid to his charge of rejecting, rejecting infant baptism. He was a Baptist for holding just what the Baptists now hold and for no other charge. He was arrested and he was condemned. He was crucified and then burned and his ashes were thrown into the Tiber if any of you are looking to swim the Tiber. He was the trumpet of liberty, says Gibbon, and it was Arnold who struck the first blow. But his memory lives, and even Rome, will his name yet become a watchword of victory. At last, on the 20th of September, 1870, it obtained its crowning victory. On that day, the Italians entered Rome. The temporal sovereignty of the Pope came to an end. The scepter was disjoined from the mitre, and the movement celebrated its triumph on the same spot where its first champion had been burned. The seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. This plague in our nation must be stopped. There must be a man willing to stand between the living and the dead. I see a Micaiah season. 
I don't see this as the days of Elijah and all these songs people are singing. We are the army of God. I think we're coming into a season where it seems much rejection has taken place. We must stand and be bold and be brave and proclaim the truth in spite of what people think about us, in spite of the consensus, in spite of popularity, in spite of it all, to remain honest and faithful with what the Lord has ordained and commanded us to do. Christ, the ultimate, took on himself the dead that we may live. He satisfied God on our behalf. He quenched the plague of plagues with his own life and power. And his gospel must be preached. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity to speak, Lord. Father, I just I commit these words into your care. I pray, Lord God, by the spirit of the living Christ, that you'd move upon us, Lord. As we continue forward, Lord, we hear many messages coming our way. Help us, Lord Jesus, to get over ourselves. Help us to put away our pride. Help us to listen. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.